I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest developments on the Leopard 2 saga, as Poland says it would seek Berlin's permission to send the German-made tanks to Ukraine. Elsewhere, Roland Oliphant is on the ground in Kiev and talks us through recent corruption scandals that have made the news in Ukraine. And Dom Nichols looks at the new Russian commander, General Grasimov's reported drive to improve day-to-day discipline by, among other things, clamping down on non-regulation haircuts. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilized energy markets the world over. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Monday, the 23rd of January, day 334. And to discuss the most recent events in Ukraine and around the world, I'm joined by our associate editor Dominic Nichols, our assistant comment editor Francis Sternley, and our senior foreign correspondent Roland Oliphant. I started by asking Dom for the latest on the Leopard 2 tanks. Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. And hi, David. Great to have you back with us. Um, Yeah, tanks. Uh, Following on from the Rammstein contact group meeting last Friday, the Secretary of State, US Secretary of State Lloyd Austin's hosted um, contact group of of supplying military aid to Ukraine. We were hoping there'd be a breakthrough in the permission from Germany uh, to allow other leopard using nations to send their leopard 2 tanks to, to Ukraine uh, and indeed to offer some themselves but that didn't come but today there have been there have been um, there have been more moves in this so germany today has said it is quote it w- will not quote stand in the way unquote if poland wants to send their leopard 2s to ukraine so this is germany's foreign minister saying for the moment the question has not been asked which i think was um if not well, I'm, I'm not going to suggest that Annalena Baybock is, is not telling the truth, but I mean, it's pretty obvious the way things have been lying for the last few weeks. But she says, for the moment, the question has not been asked. But if we were asked, we would not stand in the way. So that's Annalena Baybock, who she is a green politician, but she's in the ruling coalition. She was interviewed by French TV um, on the sidelines of a Franco-German summit in Paris today. Separately, the Polish prime minister said that, um, that his government will ask Germany for permission. Um, And if Germany does not consent to transferring either sending their own tanks or transferring the permissions for others to send tanks to to Ukraine, his country would be prepared to build what he calls, quote, a smaller coalition of countries that would send theirs anyway. And he said, permission is not a secondary matter. We will either get it quickly or do what we see fit. We will not stand by idly and watch Ukraine bleed to death, unquote. Elsewhere, so Boris Pistorius, who's German's defence minister, he, so he's due to meet Jens Stoltenberg, NATO Secretary General, tomorrow. So that might be that might be a moment to do something. Although he's he's not been as forthright as uh, as Annalena Baerbock. Um, just notable that the Kremlin has spoken on this. So remember last week they did actually speak and say, well, paraphrasing, but they said they weren't especially fussed about about Leopard Two. It's not going to do anything. They've massively changed their tune. Because yeah, it would be a huge, a huge step if um, if hundreds of tanks were gifted, Leopard 2 tanks were gifted. So Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov, he said, of course, all countries which take part directly or indirectly in pumping weapons into Ukraine and in raising its technological level bear responsibility for continuing the conflict, unquote. When he says conflict, I think he means war. But, you know, that's his words. Um, now, this is a clear jibe at Germany, you know, they're saying direct or indirectly sending weapons, clear jibe at, at Germany. But, you know, he's missed a trick. They're saying that it will continue the war. I mean, you know, come on, Dimitri, you know, the brief, everything the West does has to escalate the war, not just continue. So they've missed a trick there. It's the same same stuff as we would we would expect them to say. They're really trying to push the pressure on Germany. I think Germany is... I mean, what I said on Friday, OK, we, we disagree on the tanks at the moment, but you know, Germany, Germany is a great ally. It has supported with Marders, Gepards, RST, other, other um, you know, economic and humanitarian assistance. So this is what a healthy democracy or a healthy democratic organisation can do to have these kind of disputes in, in public, something that the Kremlin is, is not used to. So fine, Peskov, say whatever you like. Um, but uh, I think Germany can, can withstand that. Now, just... I'm just going to pause for a second, if I if I may, and and have a look at 
and I know Francis and, and others are going to are going to have a, an opinion here. But let's let's have a look at uh, Chancellor Schultz's position. And for this, I, I think Ulrich Speck, uh, foreign policy analyst, who I recommend people follow on Twitter. A lot of what what I'm about to say comes from comes from him. Uh, he is suggesting that there are two two reasons for Schultz's position. Firstly, the strategic consideration that Schultz doesn't want Ukraine to win the war or to regain a substantial amount of territory because he's he's afraid of any Russian escalation um, uh, and you you know you can always uh, think of well I mean this this idea of escalation has been around uh, a lot um, he's suggesting it's also because Schultz might be afraid of Russia destabilizing or breaking down completely as a consequence of, of a Russian loss. And he's suggesting that Schultz might be hedging for the future after the war where Russia will, will still be around and still needs to be included, he's suggesting, in some form of security architecture. So there's that side of it, the strategic consideration. Or there's just outright fear. And he's suggesting um, fear, as in Schultz has no strategic vision, no great goals, just driven by fear of Russia. And that's why he's insisting that all significant steps Germany is taking is in support of Ukraine, but must be in lockstep with the US and largely led by the US so that Russia can't single out and punish Germany. And uh, Ulrich Speck is saying that he reckons fear is the main driver. And he thinks that, that that idea of why there should not be an outright victory for Ukraine can fall, those ideas can fall on fertile ground in Berlin, and that they are not outweighed by the strategic arguments that support a Ukrainian victory. So he's suggesting that that Germany under Schultz is reliable and a strong ally as far as it is within its comfort zone. And that comfort zone is operating under full and clear US protection. But beyond that, um, Schultz is not willing to take any risks, a zero risk approach to life. And the priority he's suggesting for Schultz is to keep the US close and be a good ally, uh, not pursue a distinct German approach and strategy um, regarding regarding any sort of the war in Ukraine and any post, post-war post security architecture. But I will just take a little pause to let, um, cause there's quite a lot of red meat in there, I'll let uh, Francis and others come back. Yeah, there's an awful lot there. Thank you very much, uh, Dom. Francis, can I come to you? Can we start with uh, just this, well, you, I know you had some thoughts on all these messages flying about between these different countries saying, oh, you know, we've, we've, we haven't yet received a request for these tanks and, 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 and all of that. What, what are your thoughts on that? What's happening with, this, with the communications issues here? Has this all been a big misunderstanding and miscommunication or not? Thanks, David. It's really good to have you back. Yes, I mean, just to echo what, what John was saying, there's some quite extraordinary political machinations taking place this morning, sparked by these remarks by the German foreign minister last night that Germany wouldn't stand in the way. I think this has to be contextualized, as we did all throughout last week, that until now, Berlin, whatever they may say now, Berlin has resisted the international pressure to sanction the export of these tanks. They now seem to be saying that is not their, there was never their position, but I find that very disingenuous, to be frank, because it just doesn't stand up. There's been this... You know, the, the people are asking this morning, well, what if this was all just a great misunderstanding and mis- miscommunication? I, I just don't think that's, that's tenable, frankly. The fact is, if Germany were clear that it had no objections to other countries sending their tanks, then they would have articulated that publicly before and during the Ramstein summit. They did not do that. Why would a country like Poland apply for permission when there's no evidence that they would be accepted if they w- w- sought to, to give these, uh, these tanks. It would look bad optically for their application to be rejected, but it would also look damaging for the appearance of unity within the Western alliance. Something else, it has to be said, that has been somewhat eroded by this whole sorry saga. Putin thought it would be energy that would split the Western powers, but it's proven to be tanks and it's caused real tensions and a fissure for the first time since the war began, I think. So I do think it's pretty disingenuous, as I say, what what's coming out of the German government today. I don't wish to make it sound as if Germany have done nothing. Um, actually, they, of course, as we've been saying now for many, many months, uh, they've been integral in terms of the military support that they have provided um, for Ukraine. I think they're now the, the third biggest donator it, it would behind America and Britain. Um, But on this issue, they have been equivocating and have wobbled now for days. And it does appear, as Don was saying, 
uh, that they are now willing to concede more and more ground, which we've been saying now for several days seemed inevitable given the European pressure. And I think it's also noteworthy as well seeing the Russian reaction to this. So the Kremlin has said today that the Ukrainian people would suffer if the West sent tanks to support Kyiv. They are clearly rubbing their hands, frankly, at what they're seeing within the Western alliance over this question of leopard tanks. Uh, Dmitry Peskov, our old friend, the Kremlin spokesman, has said that the splits in Europe over whether to provide tanks to Kyiv showed there was increasing nervousness within the NATO military alliance. And I'll read the full quote. But of course, all countries which take part directly or indirectly in pumping weapons into Ukraine and in raising its technological level bear responsibility for continuing this conflict. The main thing is that it is the Ukrainian people who will pay the price for all this pseudo support. So you look at that messaging there and it's very clear that it's trying to further drive a wedge between the European and Western alliance. And it's also trying to appeal to certain Ukrainians, certain Ukrainian audiences saying, look, you know, this, the, the West is not really fully backing you here. They are going to pull the plug at some point and it's better that it happens now rather than later or, or at the very least that you realise this now because it will affect your calculations later on. So very no. And but I think it also should be said there that there is, a, a, I think, a, a slight sense of anxiety within the Kremlin. The very fact that they're commenting on this, I think they can see that, 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 that maybe the ground is shifting and want to, to apply additional pressure. But as I say, the whole thing is a very, very sorry saga. And I think that anyone who thinks that Germany come out of this looking well um, uh, are frankly deluding themselves. Well, thanks, Dom and Francis. Uh, Roland, you're on the ground in Ukraine. What what are you hearing from your contacts uh, about about this about this saga? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been pretty interesting, really. So I was kind of in, you know, having coffees with people in Kiev, and I mean, so so I'm picking up two kind of views that I've encountered. I mean, one of them, which which seems to kind of be basically throughout the kind of Ukrainian establishment, the feeling is they're going to get the tanks. And they weren't even that focused on Rammstein itself. So, you know, I, I spoke to um, Mikhail Podolyak, the, uh, an advisor to Zelensky, on, on the morning of Rammstein and asked him, so what, you know, how, how important is today? Is it, is it, is it now on earth? And he's like, no, it's not, you know, if it's not today, it will be tomorrow or the next day or next week, but it's going to happen. And it was very, uh, a real, a sense of real confidence that the, the consensus is such that Germany has no way out. And I've spoken to other people, you know, from various countries about this. And it, my impression is, I have to be careful what I said what, but, but genuinely my, my impression is that there has been a very big diplomatic effort um, designed to basically box Germany in, um, designed to, to one by one close off each of the excuses they were looking for. And that the sense here is that, okay, now they're boxed in. They, they are still going to try and maneuver, but they're going to have to eventually. And, you know, one of those, one of those was the uh, Britain supplying of um, 14 Challenger tanks. And my understanding is that that was, it didn't just look like pressure on Germany. It was very carefully coordinated um, to kind of, I mean, you could look at it two ways. You could say it's putting pressure on Germany. You could say it's giving Olaf Scholz the kind of political room to say, look, we're not doing this alone to his own public. We can go and do this. And that was the whole point of that British donation because, you know, <laughs> Challenger 2 is fantastic tanks. Everyone I've spoken to here is very grateful for them. But as we know, and we've, you know, gone through this ad nauseum on this podcast, there's just not that many of them. And in terms of, you know, the, the tank that is available in Europe and you talk about, you know, logistics and economies of scale and so on, it's the leopard that fits the bill. That's what everyone wants them to get hold of. So... A huge. I mean, I kind of agree with Francis. I mean, I, I think I think it's clear that the Germans have been pushed here, and and they continue to be pushed. The the consensus here seems to be it's going to happen, and we finally got a consensus. Eventually, the the, the leopards are going to be released. There is another point of view, which is is frankly a lot more cynical, and says, to be honest, like. I, I don't. I don't really think the Germans are committed to this. I think pressure will have to be maintained on them consistently to get them to move on this, because the fact is that they just don't want to do it. They just. They just don't have an interest in this, and they don't really see their own national interests served um, by going through with this. So that that's kind of the view down here. The other, the other interesting thing, of course, is that people in Kiev will point out to you that <laughs> this is not a new thing about tanks, right? With, with each 
stage, each stage of the conflict, there's always been this request from Ukraine for weapons, and there's been reluctance from the West, and not just from Germany, to be fair about things. So go right back to before the beginning of the war, all right, before the beginning of the war, when all the intelligence was coming in, and Western governments knew it was going to happen, the Ukraine kind of knew it was going to happen, and they were trying to get ready. Dmitry Kuleba, the Ukrainian foreign minister, was, you know, touring Western capitals, um, including London, and saying, look, the big hole we have is air defense, all right? We need your help. We need patriots or something like that to plug that gap. Um, and it, uh, that, that stuff, only that message only really got through, you know, with the advent of these this huge Russian bombing campaign on critical infrastructure, which began in October. So that took, what, how long is that? Seven, eight, nine months, something like that. So they're not that surprised that it took this long with MBTs. Um, the, as far as I understand, the next stage is those long-range missiles, the um, Atacams, I think we call them, which so far the White House has said, no, we can't give you those very long-range missiles because, you know, that might threaten Russia, might cause escalation, so on and so forth. For the Ukrainians, those are essential. They're going to need them if they're going to do a counteroffensive. And the next big diplomatic push is going to be to shift the consensus on those so that Ukraine gets those things. And they think that together with MBT, with all this, uh, the, the armored vehicles and the artillery and the air defenses they've been given, they will be able to put in a big combined arms offensive to win this war. But there's a huge amount of diplomatic legwork that goes into it. What are your impressions of, of Kiev as, as a capital in a city and, and of the people there in, in January? In, in, we're nearly a, a year into the, into the full-scale invasion. Have you had any sort of initial thoughts on, on, how, on, on how it's changed even since your last visit? Yeah, I think... Um, I mean, I mean, one thing I, I was <laughs> I was nearly late for a couple of meetings because I was still had this idea in my head of, of, it, of it as, you know, an empty city and and, you know, the main streets not being clogged up. But no, I mean, there's I don't know if you'd say there is as many people in the capital as before the war, but definitely the streets are as busy and you definitely have to once again, you know, take account of rush hour if you're trying to get across town. So I've, I've had to adjust to that. I mean, people I know here have said, look, a lot of those people are displaced from other parts of Ukraine. And a lot of, you know, kind of native, Kiev natives have, have moved on further west or abroad. Yeah, life goes on. It's, it's, it's dark in the evenings, kind of 25% of streetlights working. Um, there's this kind of emphasis on energy saving. The air isn't amazing because almost every small business has got a petrol generator outside chugging away on the pavement to kind of make up for these, you know, the shortages induced by this bombing campaign. But honestly, I mean, my main impression is that everybody is just... Just bloody tired, basically. You know, I mean, I, 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 saw a, I saw a friend the other day who said she was getting, you know, basically quite irritated with this, with what she saw as this narrative in the Western press of, oh, look, you know, Russia's bombing campaign has, has, has failed to crack Ukrainian spirit and Ukrainians are all laughing at them. And she's like, yes, yes, it has failed and they haven't cracked us and all of that. But it, it's been bloody hard, you know, and, and living for months and months with you know, are you going to wake up with, you know, none of your utilities working, no water, no electricity, no whatever, if you're going to have to go up and down, you know, a huge apartment block, you don't know if you can wash, what if, what if your apartment gets hit like the one in Dnipro, you just don't know, but then you have to make the decision about, okay, am I going to go to the bomb shelter? Well, if I do that, I'm going to be exhausted and I've got work tomorrow. Maybe I'll sleep in, in the, in the bathroom. That's a little bit more sheltered, or maybe I'll just stay in bed and, and crack on because at the end of the day I'm going to have to go to work and I can't, you know, being tired because there's an air aid is not an excuse. So there's, um, people are tired, you know, and I, I spoke to another guy and I would, um, a government contact of mine and he was just, I, the, the look on his face was just completely drawn, completely kind of a year, a, a year without a day off basically. And he was saying to me, you know, I just, I just look at the pictures of the guys in the trenches out in the East and I know I've got it easy. But, you know, the, the strain is telling. That's not to say there's any sense of, you know, flagging of morale or, or any kind of constituency calling for, you know, talks or surrender or anything like that. But it's um, it, it has been a year of war um, and there's no real end in sight immediately. And I think that is that is palpable. Well, thanks very much for that, Roland. Francis, I, I know you wanted to come in on, on something Roland said earlier. Yes, just very briefly, I think this question of the German government and their decisions here, we're often contextualising it as being decisions by Olaf Scholz and his direct ministers in the coalition. But I do think it is worth emphasising a point that we made on Thursday last week when we had Dr Thomas Clausen on, which is 
the fact that this does align broadly with some of the more recent polls in Germany, the German foreign policy, there is anxiety amongst the German population. It's sort of pretty much split down the middle, 50-50, as to whether they feel like enough is being done or whether they actually want to do more. And many are hesitant about the delivery of these tanks and what it might mean. And of course, we've speculated now for many, many months as to why there is this tendency in Germany. Of course, it has a huge historical factor in part of it. It's also short term political challenges as well. But nonetheless, I do think it's just worth emphasizing that this is an issue that is broader than just the decisions made by the German class. This is something that actually is it's quite prevalent amongst amongst large portions of the German population itself. Thanks, Francis. Dom, I want to talk a little bit about the MOD update from today. This came out this morning from the British um, Ministry of Defence. I'm just going to read it out because I think it's useful to hear the entire thing. General Valery Gerasimov, Russia's chief of the general staff and newly appointed commander in Ukraine, has likely started his tour with the drive to improve deployed troops' day-to-day -day discipline. Since he took command, officers have been attempting to clamp down on non-regulation uniform, travel in civilian vehicles, the use of mobile phones and non-standard haircuts. As the MOD goes on to say, the measures have been met with sceptical feedback. That's, those are their words. But we've, we, we've had a chat about this and there's, there's a few things to get into. Do you want us to, you want to talk us through your thoughts? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, this is it's an interesting one. It came from, as, as you said, UK Defence Intelligence. Um, it's, a, it's a reasonable point. They make no, no way of verifying how they get the information. But this, this idea that, 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 he's, that Gerasimov has gone in and he's going to impose discipline through the, uh, through the medium of beards um, is an interesting one. I mean, so beards in the military, traditionally soldiers not supposed to wear um, beards because it's then not possible to get a, a complete seal with your respirator so your your chemical respirator your NBC nuclear biological chemical respirator that allows you to continue to survive in a in a chemical environment that you need to have a seal around your uh, around your entire body so clothing elsewhere but on your face you have this big sort of the black leech as it was called big rubber um, respirator with a with a tight tight seal around your your face so the air can't get in now that's not possible to do if you've got if you've got a big beard. So traditionally, soldiers don't uh, don't wear beards, um, and then that sort of went by. In the, I'm speaking from the British military perspective, that kind of went by the wayside a little bit in Iraq, Afghanistan, where the the threat from a from a chemical environment was was almost nil. From um, I mean, I, I know we went there looking for weapons of mass destruction, but you know, I mean, there there were some legacy chemical munitions which you know I, I was involved with, and but story for another day. But you know, there weren't the the biggies probably straying into mass kind of Wikipedia territory here. But anyway, um, so the the threat was the threat was marginal, um, and that and then you've got to put that on on top of things like beards and um, wearing non regulation kit. Um, so on and so forth. It's seen as these are sort of flashes of individuality. They're seen as kind of non-conformist, a bit edgy, or in the British military terminology, to be a bit alley, you know, a bit kind of ooh, a bit ooh moi. Um, and there's a point for that. You know, you do want men and women to be pumped full of confidence and all the rest of it if you're asking them to put their life in harm's way. But, yeah, there is a, there is a point uh, line, I would suggest. And I think the British military came up against that line in Iraq. Um, yeah, it's all, all well wearing non-standard kit and uh you know having beard and long hair and all, all the rest of it you know if you can you you know if you if you can talk the talk but you know if you can't walk the walk then you've got to be a bit careful and um as any uh u.s brothers and sisters in arms that took part in the charge of the night 2008 will know uh, that was when the, the british army had effectively lost control of basra um this was obviously that the context was the political imperative from the then Prime Minister Gordon Brown um, to, for no casualties, which you just can't do. You know, no military commander can can promise that without just not not going out, and that that's effectively what happened. So the Brits pulled back to the airport in Basra. Uh, we became onlookers to the insurgency. Basra went up in flames, and the, the charge of the knights was the U.S. and the and the their mentored Iraqi um, army colleagues that came down and basically took over and reimposed order in in Basra and the Brit the Brits we were effectively mitted. So MIT was in, you know, the military transition teams, that's what we were doing. We were mitting the the Iraqis sort of showing them how to be a proper army in X, Y, and Z. And we the Brits were effectively mitted by the Americans because we'd lost control of Basra. So, you know, the point I'm making is look hard, look tough, look alley, 
um, you know, you lobby hard to, to have non-standard weapons to make you feel special if you want. Special, by the way, being the, the worst word in the British military lexicon, my pet, pet hobby horse. Although I think the US have got it right with special ops forces rather than special forces. But anyway, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, start with the ability to cut the mustard and achieve your mission and then grow your beard. Don't do it the other way around. And in terms of what Gerasimov's doing, if you're trying to develop the force... Um, starting with beards and uniforms and, and all that kind of stuff is the wrong way to do it. You know, if, you, if your force lacks the discipline and morality and military professionalism, then, you know, those kind of things, you've got to have them as the, as the start and then move into going on to the, these lapses of discipline about beards and, and so on and so forth. Do it the other way around. It speaks of a fundamental disconnect between what those at the top, in this case, Gerasimov, thinks and wants and the reality of the ground. So I think... I think this is good news for Ukraine because it speaks that, that Gerasimov just, I mean, he's either got his priorities in the wrong way round or he just doesn't really have a have a feel for what's happening at, at ground level. Um, so, yeah, a, a small a small point here, segue into why beards and, and what have you. But, um, yeah, I hope that goes somewhere. I'm sorry, beards and discipline, the word special and the, you know, long shadow of uh, Charge of the Knights rattles my cage. But I, I hope some of that made sense. No, absolutely. I mean, and just very quickly, th- th- there's also a way in which this plays into the ongoing tension between uh, Grasimov and Shoigu on, on one side and, and Prigozhin on, on the other side. Uh, do you want to speak to, a little to that? Yeah, yeah, of course. And um, yeah, I should have mentioned. So this was this was actually highlighted today by the Institute for the Study of War, US-based think tank, who was saying that Evgeny Prigozhin, who's the head of the Wagner group, they say, he, he'll quote, his star has begun to set, unquote, after... Um, the last few months where it seems to be you know, his, his, his sort of political standing was on the, was on the rise um, because he's failed to take Bakhmut. So we, we used to speak about, well, we still do speak about Bakhmut, of course. And in recent weeks, we've talked about Solodar, which is just about five or six k to the northeast of Bakhmut in the Donbass. Um, so Bakhmut was a, yeah, a reasonable logistic choke point, but not, you know, not the biggest town or city to worry about in the in the in the Donbass and Russia and the Wagner group in particular have been smashing their heads against that and then Solidar is an even smaller town so you know Russia seems to have taken Solidar and they've they've done it with great fanfare and of course they've got to they've got to do that because it's the only place they've, they've been going forward in the last few months but what looks like has happened is that Putin turned some time ago to Prigozhin and to General Sorovkin, who put Sorovkin in charge of the of the military campaign, um, and said to them, "Right, off you go. Go and do uh, go do what you can with with um, mobilised forces, with prisoners." Uh, and Sorovkin, you got your air campaign. You say is going to crack Ukrainian infrastructure and their will to keep fighting. Off you go. Now, both of those efforts failed. Okay, yes, Solidar was taken, and some other very small pockets of ground. But the Wagner Group really not not done a huge amount, and they've they've largely broken themselves on it they've they've culminated which as you know the military expression culmination is you're not being pushed back but you've, you've exhausted yourself you can no longer maintain offensive operations you're not going forward so the Wagner group have kind of stalled Sorovkin's air campaign stalled and it now looks like Putin said right fellas you've had you've had your day he's gone back to the old methods of the of the MOD. So uh, Gerasimov, who's in charge of the entire Russian armed forces, he's now also in charge of the day-to-day running of, of the war. He's in charge of the, the theatre in, in Ukraine, as well as the whole of Russia's armed forces. So he's, he's doing that. And Sergei Shoigu um, is the defence minister. And it, and it looks as if um, Putin's thinking, well, all I've got all I've got for backing those other two is a small town in the Donbass and I've lost a load of precision-guided munitions. Get the old guys back in, Karasimov, Shoyu, who might have an idea about how to do this, about how to build an army. We are told that the second half of this first wave of mobilisation is not just trying to shove people out into the Donbass to, to run at the Ukrainians. They are trying to build them as a coherent fighting force. But that's going to take absolutely months and years. And it starts with culture and the Russian military culture ain't great. So, you know, Shoigu and Grasimov might have the right idea, but I just I just don't think they've got the time or the resources to do it. And, and this whole point is that there's this there's this spat between who who is in favour, who is in Putin's favour at the moment, who is the um, who is going to be seen as the the military face of success for this for this war? And um, as ISW was saying, the star seems to have set on Prigozhin 
Sorovkin has been has been demoted. He's he's one of three deputy commanders, so he's underneath Gerasimov. Not been sacked completely, um, but you know very clearly a a a battlefield demotion for Sorovkin. So a real power play in there there in the Kremlin um, between the tactics of of Prigozhin and, and Sorovkin vice. The old way of Shoigu and Garasimov, and uh, yeah, and and then you see Garasimov coming in saying, right, the first thing we need to do is reimpose discipline. Uh, you know, tie your boots up, tuck your shirt in, and shave your beard. Thanks very much, uh, Dom. Roland, can I come to you? In your notes um, this morning, you mentioned several important uh, domestic stories in Ukraine to do with corruption. Can you talk us through what's been happening? I mean, essentially. Context is, since the war began, we've had a kind of a moratorium on Ukraine's traditionally fractious and dramatic um, and never boring domestic politics. Um, everything's been focused on the war. And then last night, um, uh, in his uh, nightly address to the nation, um, Mr. Um, sorry, uh, <laughs> President Zelensky, um, for some well, I'll explain the reason in a second, um, decided not to talk about the war. He talked about domestic issues. He talked about justice. And he talked about how, look, I've just fired um, a minister. I'll get to that in a second. And I want everyone to understand that the same thing's going to happen if, um, you know, if we find other people not living up to the um, standards of justice. And, and I am, you know, although there is a war on and I'm focused on foreign policy and military affairs and defense, it doesn't mean I'm not aware of, of what people are saying about about procurement and the military and things like this. Now, the context for this is a couple of um, a couple of separate corruption scandals um, that broke over the weekend. So uh, on Saturday, NABU, that's the National um, Anti-Corruption Committee, um, sorry, National Anti-Corruption service force agency um arrested a the deputy minister for the regions um just give me two seconds um yeah so so the, the deputy minister for um regions uh, infrastructure and development his name is vasily lazinski and he was caught red-handed um accepting a four hundred thousand dollar bribe allegedly for fixing the procurement of generators um, which were intended for, um, you know, to keep civilians warm, to keep water pumping, things like that, um, uh, for, for arranging a, an inflated price for those things. Um, so he's been arrested. Um, he hasn't uh, been convicted yet, but he's been charged, um, and Mr. Zelensky fired him straight away. Um, now, at the same time, um, a, a rather good Ukrainian uh, news website called uh, Zerkla Nedjeli, that's Mirror of the Week, um, published its own investigation. They had got hold of a procurement contract from the Ministry of Defense, um, which they said showed that the ministry was paying um, two to three times over the market price for basic foodstuffs like eggs, potatoes, chicken thighs. Um, and the, the allegation that the, uh, the newspaper and the journalist made was that this was a, um, a transparent case of basically defrauding the taxpayer and that some bureaucrats in the Ministry of Defence um, were in cahoots with the supplier and they were they were skimming off the difference, um, basically. Now, Alexei Reznikov, the Defence Minister, has strongly denied this. Um, uh, the Defence Ministry put out his own statement saying, OK, we're calling a, um, we're calling a meeting with the Parliamentary Defence Committee. We're going to present all of the all of the facts, all of the documents, um, to demonstrate that um, this is not the case, and also um, we're going to hand a bunch of material to the the SBU, the Domestic Security Service, um, to investigate dissemination of deliberately false information damaging to defence interests. Um, uh, the journalists aren't backing down. Um, there's a there's a prominent anti-corruption campaigner who's kind of backed the journalists and said, "No, this is this is this is really bad, guys," um, and it's. Um, and 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 this guy's repeating the allegations that Reznikov is um, is responsible. Um, now, how that plays out, I don't know. But it, it it's interestingly occurs at around about the same time as all these rumours are swirling about a big reshuffle coming up. Um, Zelensky hasn't really reshuffled his cabinet since um, the war began. Um, but there are reports going around that some ministers are going to go. Ukrainska Pravda today was saying um, maybe the ministers of Sport, Fuel, and Energy. And, and Minister of Strategic Industries might be ready for the axe. That that wasn't explicitly linked with any allegations of wrongdoing, by the way. Um, but just 
just an interesting little development. It, it kind of suggests that this moratorium on domestic politics and concerns um, that existed for, for the first part of the war may be beginning to thaw. Um, you can't just pretend that the issues of day-to-day -day government just go away um, because there is a war on it, you know, especially when it's going been going on um, for a year. So it'll be interesting to see, I think, this week, um, Mr. Zelensky said in his address that decisions are going to be made. This week will be the time of appropriate decisions and they're already prepared. Um, and he wouldn't say exactly what those were, but that's widely interpreted to mean um, some heads are going to roll this week. Thank you very much uh, for that, Roland. Thank you for talking us through um, some events in Ukraine. Francis, I know you had a, a brief comment on this as well. Yes, just one thing. I think it is worth underlining the point that Ukraine has been especially sensitive to the charge that their country is corrupt. That's one of the few criticisms of Ukraine that has gained some traction given the historical issues that the country has had prior to the war. As we've spoken about before, there is this is something that Zelensky personally is invested in stamping out. Not only does he, I think, genuinely want to see the end of corruption in the country, something that for many Ukrainians see as the legacy of, 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 of the Soviet Union, but also because he knows the reputational damage that it could do. We spoke last week about how one of Zelensky's presidential advisors resigned by deviating too much from the government's line. And I think that we should see all of this in the context of there being a thawing of, uh, of, 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 of political discourse, that things have sort of, whilst they were solid before, there is a sense in which things are a little bit more liquid now. Discussions that are being had now may not have happened earlier on in the war. And that's understandable, as, as Roland was saying, given how critical this moment is, whether it be about future reshuffles, whether it be because of the kind of difficult disagreements about the future strategy in the months ahead. But nonetheless, I think this is something that, that we have to watch and pay, pay particular attention to. Ukrainian unity has been absolutely integral to their success in the war so far. Serious splits could be damaging and these kind of scandalous stories could be damaging and particularly something utilised by Russian propaganda. So uh, just something to be sensitive to with all of this is that uh, I think it's, it's, it's very, very interesting and, and something that's well worth us, us continuing to cover. Thank you very much, Francis and Roland. There's just one more story I think we should um, pick up on before we go to our final thoughts. That's uh, former um, British PM Boris Johnson made a, uh, a visit to Ukraine on, on, on the weekend. Um, Roland, can I come to you first? How was this received in, in Ukraine? What did people say? I mean, people here love him. I mean, it's just, um, it's, I'm sure, I know every journalist who, who talks to the British public about about this kind of underlines this, but it really is a discord you, you would not recognise you know, the Ukrainian public attitude to Boris Johnson and, and, and the domestic British public attitude to Boris Johnson over here, he can do no wrong. I mean, he is basically a national hero over here um, because, you know, fair enough, because he played an absolutely key role in, ra in rallying the West at, at the beginning of the war. Um, and, you know, he was the first, if not the first and one of the first Western leaders into Kiev after the war began, you know, not that long after the liberation of, um, of Kiev region um, and the battle here. Um, so he was, he was welcomed um, with open arms. It was an unannounced visit. Um, so I woke up in the morning and, and got a little sniff that he was touring around Butcher and Bolodjanka, those, those two suburbs up north of Kiev where um, saw a lot of fighting during the, uh, the battle for the city um, and and where, of course, the Russians committed some horrible war crimes. Um, so he was around there. Um, then he came to town, um, saw Mr. Zelensky at the presidential um, presidential administration in central Kiev, um, sat down, was greeted. Now, the funny thing is about this, of course, is that Boris Johnson is not the prime minister. Um, he's not even a minister. He is a serving MP. Um, but you know, he, he's not head of state or government, but he was treated pretty much like he was. I mean, I, I, I spoke to some Ukrainian contacts and I said, well, we don't know how to how to characterize this because it's not really an official visit, but he's an MP, but, but it's not exactly a private visit. Um, we don't know. Um, uh, it was obviously good for Boris Johnson. I think it was good for for, for Zelensky because Boris Johnson is, is so popular here. Um, I mean, his... <laughs> I think I think Boris's um, his message would have been welcome here because the one thing he did say publicly was basically 
um, to pile more pressure on the Germans. That that was the the nub of the one thing that he that he said that his spokesman put out. Um, he said, you know, the time is now to give um, to give Ukraine all of the tools um, to finish the job. So so very much in line um, with 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 the British government message, with the Ukrainian government's message. Um, clearly not trying to kind of um, freelance his own foreign policy because the foreign policy is the same, but certainly. Um, I think I think it'd be reasonable to say that he's trying to make himself prominent. And if I was Rishi Sunak, I might be a little bit irritated by that. Um, but on the whole, here um, massively welcome. Um, in fact, I've just I just had lunch at the um, there is a cafe in Kiev which has made a point of creating a special cross on creation called the Boris Johnson. Um, I had one uh, for my kind of elevenses this morning. Um, it's rather nice. It's got um, kind of apple and, and, and cinnamon and things like that. In. Um, so, so, so worth it if you're down in um, down in Padil in Kiev to to drop in and eat one of those. Well, thank you very much, Roland Francis. Just before we go to our final thoughts, would you give us potentially some more context for our non-British uh, listeners on why former PM um, Boris Johnson might find this an appropriate time to make an unannounced visit to Ukraine and meet Zelensky? Yes, I think the timing is interesting. And Roland's touched on the key point already, which, of course, is that there are tensions at the moment within the British government about its stance on Ukraine. There are some who, and I'm sure that Boris Johnson is one of them, who feel that the British government could be doing even more, in at least being seen publicly to be uh, championing it in the way that, of course, he did uh, when the invasion began. I think also it's important to underline that Boris Johnson is still considered somebody who could threaten Rishi Sunak's position prior to the next general election. Uh, it's, it's due uh, either late next year or early 2025, depending on one's uh, uh, when, when that election is specifically called. But nonetheless, uh, the, the, the point stands that there's rumours, and, and sometimes you could say more than rumours, that Boris Johnson feels that he was wrongly ousted from power, that he's learned from his mistakes, and that he wants to show that he is still the man to beat. And there is speculation that if Rishi Sunak continues to be uh, making certain decisions that he has, he's not been seen as leading from the front on many, many issues here in Britain, that there may be an opportunity where Rishi Sunak is forced to resign and Boris Johnson once again becomes Prime Minister. It would be pretty extraordinary. I personally think it's very, very unlikely myself. I think the Conservative Party, Boris Johnson's former party, uh, knows what uh, how um, destructive that would be to the unity of the party and how much the public have, have strongly turned against Boris Johnson. But nonetheless, I think Boris Johnson believe this, believes this and many of his supporters do too. So I think whilst I do believe firmly that Boris Johnson believes that, you, that the Ukrainian cause is one that he backs fully to the hilt and that Britain can be doing more on, and I think this, this should be seen in that context, got to also mention that th this is politically valuable for him as well at what is quite an interesting moment in British politics. Thanks, Roland and Francis, for that. Uh, I think we've just about run out of time today between us, so can I just go to all of you for your final thoughts? Uh, Dom Nichols, would you like to start? Sure. Well, as a final thought, let's talk briefly, very briefly, about Norwegian Chief of Defence General Eric Christofferson, who on uh, Norwegian TV2, the TV2 channel, spoke about casualties. I only mention it because we so so rarely get any official opinion on casualties. Now, none of it can be verified, of course, but he was suggesting that Russia have suff has suffered 180,000 killed and wounded in action. So total casualties, wounded and killed, 180,000, which was the size of the force that we think went in on February the 24th last year. So imagine the entirety of that force, which you can imagine was the best that Russia chose to put in the field or was able to put in the field, that's now gone. So Russia is left with mobilised people, conscripts, others that they've managed to bring up um, in the in the last few months, the People's Militia, as they call themselves, from Donetsk and, and Luhansk, and the Wagner Group and other mercenaries, So and the Chechens, of course. So, you know, it's it's not a great force that Russia's got in, in the country. And where are they going to get the instructors from to train those people? Well, they're either there fighting or they're dead. So the, the prospect of Russia developing this, this, this new army are, are, are slim. Now, uh, General Christofferson was suggesting the Ukrainian military has suffered about 100,000. That's killed and wounded. And again, as I reiterate the point. There's no way of, of us verifying these figures. And, and I would have thought he's, you know, he's much closer to it than we are. But you know, there's still a lot of wheel room here. 100,000 Ukrainian military and 30,000 Ukrainian civilians. That is probably a bit easier to um, put an accurate figure on or to release anyway. 
And General Christofferson said um, that despite these heavy losses, quote, Russia has the ability to manufacture more equipment and withdraw equipment from storage and mobilize more manpower, i.e. just don't, they don't worry about the training, they just push them forward. They've got more stuff, as we've seen, T-64 tanks, for example, literally museum pieces being brought out and pushed up to the front. And General Christofferson saying Russia is capable of continuing this war for a very long time. What is most worrying is whether Ukraine will be able to keep the Russian Air Force out of the war. We haven't seen a large effort from the Russian Air Force due to Ukrainian air defence, air defences. Um, and he says if Ukraine are to go on the offensive this winter, they need them quickly, them being tanks. Um, so that's the end of quote from General Christofferson. Just to put it in perspective, last November, US uh, Joint Chief of Staff, uh, Chairman of Joint Chiefs, uh, General Mark Milley, he suggested that Russian army had, had lo lost about 100,000 dead or wounded with a, quote, probably similar toll, unquote, on the Ukrainian side. Um, so we're in that ballpark. Obviously, 100 to 180,000 in four months is, is quite a leap. But, I mean, if you look at the the people that Russia have had in that time, largely mobilised manpower, untrained, ill-equipped, poorly led, just been rushing at Bakhmut and Solidar in, in, over the last few months, and Ukraine have been have been killing them in their in their thousands. So so those figures it could have jumped from 100,000 to 180 um, thousand killed and wounded. But just some just some figures there, um, and we need to keep an eye on the Donbass now and see what the Wagner Group will do if we think they've culminated and if they're going to they're going to sort of finish at Solidar, wave the flag and say job done, um, or whether they think they can still go at Bakhmut, which I don't think they can. But Prigozhin, especially in the position he's now in, as we mentioned earlier, he might feel politically as if he has to try and keep try and keep pushing forward in some in some guys. But that will that will come uh, that become more obvious in the next few weeks. Thank you very much, Dom. Francis Sternley. Thanks, David. Just a story that caught my eye, uh, one that hasn't really been commented much on in the Western press as far as I can see, which is the fact that Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov was in South Africa earlier today. I assume he's still there for talks with what is now considered one of Russia's more important allies on the continent. Uh, he's meeting South Africa's foreign mis minister and there's, they haven't really released much of a schedule of what they're going to be commenting on, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it's being condemned by some opposition parties in South Africa and the small Ukrainian community in South Africa as being very insensitive and ill-judged. Now, this comes off the back of already being announced, which I think was last month, that there are plans to be a war games session conducted in South African waters uh, with Russia and China involved and South Africa involved. You can imagine some of the criticisms that have been made with regard to that. People who feel that this is really South Africa, and obviously this news today will add to this, that South Africa has chosen a side that uh, it is aligning itself more strongly with the Russian uh, agenda on this. And I'd be very interested to hear from listeners, we know we have them in South Africa, on their perspective on what's going on, perhaps the reaction there, because it does seem that a decision is being made here, or at least underlining a decision previously made, at a time that is, of course, particularly sensitive in the war. And as I've been saying now for many months, I'm sure listeners are sick of me saying so, there are anxieties about Africa on on uh, the African continent on the question of, of, of support for, for Russia and China particularly. They have been working for many, many years, those countries, in order to encourage support narratives that, that, that promote their view of the world. And there has been su su success in that. And I think uh, that the anxiety on this is that if this was really meant to be the war, as the UN articulated earlier on, that showed actually that Russia would be cut out, would be cut off, um, completely diplomatically and show these nations who perhaps were wobbling earlier on uh, abstaining in key votes that, uh, that, that, you know, if you back Russia, then there would be a cost to pay and it would be beyond the pale for you in the future. Um, it would suggest that those, those attempts have not succeeded fully uh, around the world because the fact is he's there shaking hands with the foreign minister now. So a rather worrying development. And I apologise on that's the one on which I want to end. Well, thank you, Dom and Francis. Uh, Roland Oliphant, uh, can we hear your very final thoughts? Yeah, I think um, time is off the essence. I mean, I'd like to play off everything the other guys have said. I mean, in terms of tanks and, and time and, and this winter, I mean, the sense here is, yeah, they, they, they need these things quick because they, they, they want to do a big combined arms offensive because they are convinced the only way to finish this war is on the battlefield by pushing the Russians out of the country. And you need... Western MBTs to do that. So the, you know, 
the message from here is this is <laughs> this is this isn't some kind of you know tantrum or some kind of politicking or something about these tanks that they're, they're really really crucial things you know they're not the end of the story dom's always reminding us that you know you need the whole orchestra in warfare a tank isn't much use by itself but they're absolutely essential um from uh from the point of view here and i, I don't think that the you know the scandal around this is is confected or, or exaggerated it's a it, it's a crucial decision for the west to make about how they want this war to end and we we can talk about that debate again in the future on on south africa i mean it's in context to put there so the russians have been making an effort to rule africa for some years before the war you know a while before the war vladimir putin hosted this sochi summit of african leaders so it's kind of a continuation of a pre-war russian policy of of kind of reviving a lot of the connections that the Soviet Union had on the continent, but also um, looking for new ones. But it's not just in South Africa. Right? So I, I turned on the TV um, in my hotel room the other day, and there was this BBC World Report on about how the French were losing were losing influence in in Burkina Faso. And and I do apologise for the BBC if I missed it. But but I kept on listening for the word Russia, and it wasn't mentioned once. Maybe it was there, I missed it. But the reason I was listening for the word Russia is because they had this anti-French demonstration they were filming, and it was full of people waving Russian tricolours. So Russia's, you know, Russians get, Russia's games in Africa, Russia's prioritization of Africa is a really, really serious thing. And one would hope that, you know, Western governments and policymakers are, are awake to that and are not neglecting it. Because I do kind of feel that one reason we are in the mess we're in now is been a long running sense of complacency, you know, what Russia's up to and also what it's capable of. So I do hope Africa is not being neglected. Um, the last thing is, j j just to be fair, so I said I had a, a Boris Johnson cross on, which was quite nice. The same place does do a Rishi soon. That's got um, masala, cardamom, and mango in, which I may try next time I'm there. I was told there is a Liz Trust, but I can't find it on the menu. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, And today on Twitter, Claire Hubble. <laughs>